So delegates, let's give a round of applause to our new state superintendent, Mohammed Chaudhary, as we have a conversation with him today. You made it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. We send all the sound people crazy. <laughs> Delegates, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Superintendent Chaudhary, who's joining us today. And I can tell you even more why it's my pleasure is the superintendent and I meet monthly, which has not happened before. <laughs> <laughs> and he has, we have a tendency to text at times too, and he allows us, uh, we meet with his staff. So it has been a very collaborative relationship. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you guys rearranging. I'm just glad my flat tire happened at Easton and not after Easton. And so uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so Absolutely. much. I'm excited. Excited to be here um, and excited to uh, get to experience this conference for the first time. It won't be the last. Um, um, and so please, please, please definitely um, shoot away. <laughs> All right. And I, I will save you the conversation because when we meet, he usually shows pictures of his new daughter, <laughs> and I show pictures of my new great niece and great nephew. So we'll spare all of you the pictures. But I also want to let you know, just for your well being, that Rachel McCusker from the board is in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So one of my bosses is here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So. Um, Mohammed, you began your career as a middle school teacher mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. What did you love most about your time in the classroom? Um, so that's, there's so many things. I think the thing that I, you know, I taught in South LA and uh, East LA, and oftentimes there's so many stereotypes of what students can do. Of course there are challenges, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, every kid shows up every day wanting to learn um, and watching them <laughs> grasp a concept, watching them teach each other a concept, watching them go off to another teacher's class and that teacher come to me and say, thank you for passing them on with uh, skills so I can now pass on the next uh, set of standards off to them. Those kinds of things uh, meant a lot to me. I would say my favorite though, um, ultimately it was when they would come back to my classroom when they were in high school and tell me what they're doing next. Because at the end of the day, what you do, and you can't measure this. No, no state accountability system can measure this. It's all of the social soft skills that teachers embed that we don't recognize often. Uh, it is hard to measure. I know we have a survey in the state, but those things have lifetime effects. And when they come back to me and said, I'm going off to college, I'm doing this, I failed a class, I'm, I'm retaking it. I love those moments because, um, because you didn't give up on me, because you thought the best of me. And those are the things that teachers do every day. And we just don't recognize that and those lifetime, and they don't always show up on a test score. And, and I think it's important that we learn how to recognize that, so. I think, that, I think the people here agree we can't test that, yeah. but that's the most important item there. So how many of you have seen the superintendent in your school? So I see some hands up. So you're going around, you're visiting classrooms, and you're shadowing students at different grade levels. What have you learned and observed as so far from educators and students yeah. from these visits? So, you know, I'm a year and a few months in, and if you know something about me is I go and spend entire days. I'll shadow a student for half the day. I'm not a fan of dog and pony show visits. Yeah, it's still awkward. There's an, there's a, there, it's still awkward, there's an overgrown kid in your classroom, but, uh, but at the end of the day, um, after a, you know, a, a, the first 30 minutes, uh, people get comfortable. Um, one, Maryland um, is very diverse. Um, the landscape is uh, very different, uh, but, but many similarities in terms of needs and challenge. But what is very common is how hard teachers are working. The number of things that teachers do that go above and beyond is amazing to me. And so that is something I have learned. I have also learned that it's not just limited to the teachers in the classroom. I have been in class. 
I was in a classroom, I won't name the district, a, a fight almost broke out. The education support prof professional is the one who calmed the class down, not the teacher. Um, and, you know, I was in the cafeteria watching the staff being able to hype up the, the, the room and being able to get kids excited. The entire network of things that are happening every day is amazing. But at the end of the day, what I'll say you, what I'll say is happening is people are doing things above and beyond what their job description says in order to figure, uh, get it right for kids. And that's, that's, that's something you just do, but that's not something that always makes it, and we gotta uh, makes it into your compensation. And frankly, we gotta find a way to make that happen. So, so. I don't think you'll get an argument here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you'll get an argument. So I know you've talked about one of the reasons you uh, were particularly excited about coming to Maryland was because of the blueprint for mm -hmm. Maryland's future. So implementing the blueprint is a huge priority of our students, educators, and state, mm -hmm. and for you as a superintendent. Mm -hmm. What is your vision for the blueprint and the impact that it will have on our students? And you have time to go into this, because I know this, yeah. is a, this is a topic that, yeah. that gets you excited about education. Yeah, yeah. It's a big question when people always ask me, what is your vision? Um, you know, there's several things, right? I hope that the blueprint shows when you put your money where your mouth is um, that we can get excellent outcomes for our kids. Um, but it's not just about kids. It's about also being the place to be, to be an educator, to be education support professional. It's the, it should be the place to be all those things in the country. Um, I don't think the blueprint is perfect, but I think it is eons ahead of what else exists in the country. There's no other bill that is looking at every aspect of education, right, from pre-K all the way up to college and career and beyond. Of course, I want to see more kids kinder ready. I want to see more kids reading by third grade. I want kids ready for advanced math by the time they leave middle school. All those things I want to see because at the end of the day, you know, you want to make sure kids are reading by third grade so our middle school teachers can focus on what they need to focus on. I'm excited about community schools. Um, it's still, you know, I've never seen a state invest uh, so much in wraparound services. I will say, um, I still, it's a reflection of our society that schools have become the site of wraparound services. What does that say about our social safety nets that are still broken? But we have to leverage schools for that. Um, and so I often like to say, and you've heard me say it before, I was a damn good teacher in South LA because I was a damn good social worker, but that's not sustainable. And we gotta find ways to make sure our teachers can teach, our education support professionals can do what they do, but there's all these other needs, right? I was in a classroom in Western Maryland where the teacher had a food pantry. Why does the teacher have a food pantry, you know? Um, because she knows that the students need that, right? But that's not, that's a reflection of societal failure that we need to be able to take care of. And Maryland is one of the most affluent states in the country. So what I am most excited about is we have a chance to figure it out. We have a chance to show that we can narrow gaps. We can create the most well-paid profession, hopefully in the country, um, and, and, and figure that out. And there is a State Department of Ed who is willing to lean into, um, you know, disrupt lines, support, do what we can to be able to figure this out. So that's what I'm most excited about, and, um, and hopefully we can pull it off. <laughs> I think you hear some support yeah. for that. <laughs> Um, I, 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 it's my only little intermission. I was at the Maryland Association of Boards of Education when superintendent uh, reported and had the boards of education members take a gallery walk to look at where concentration of poverty was in their districts, mm -hmm. look at the demographics. And I truly was amazed at some of the remarks of the boards of education members. I really maybe shouldn't have been exactly surprised. Mm -hmm. But you've taken great lengths to share the data to make sure people see where, where mm -hmm. the needs are and where we need to invest our money. Mm -hmm. So I def definitely appreciate that, mm -hmm. those efforts. Um, I started with you know, my own personal experiences. We've ha been talking. We, we, we talk frequently, mm -hmm. um, supporting each other. We, we may not always agree mm -hmm. on, on where we're going, mm -hmm. but the c lines of communication have truly been, been mm -hmm. open, so I definitely appreciate mm -hmm. that. Because it's very important to us that educator voices are in the mm -hmm. room. Mm -hmm. I'll use my Hamilton expression. Yes. In the room where it happens, we, we need to be there. 
So how do you view the importance of educator voices being mm -hmm. at the table? Mm -hmm. And do you have advice for local superintendents as mm -hmm. they're leading in the local? Absolutely. So one, it's absolutely crucial. Um, you know, I was one of those teachers who always wanted to be in the work group when the, my principal was coming up with a new idea. Or if central office in Los Angeles wanted to roll out something new and ask for a teacher representative. Um, I don't think it happens naturally. So one big advice is don't stop bothering them about it. <laughs> so uh, my superintendents may not like that, but you, we, should, we should always knock on their door about teacher voice. Um, and not just voice, but actual participation when pra a policy gets crafted, right? Um, so recently the department had to put out um, the requirements for how blueprint implementation plans have to come out. And one of the feedback that I got from um, the, some of the systems was like, well, we'll just um, organically form our groups. Why are you laying out all of these people that you have to speak to and engage and who needs to be part of the, the writing team? I said, because you're not gonna naturally do that. Uh, district, central office, are naturally designed to operate in top-down manners. You forget, like they, you were a classroom teacher and then you go to the central office, you, you forget about bottom-up change and, and such. So one of the things I'm committing to in the department is making sure that those requirements are um, expected um, and formal, um, and so we did that. Um, I would say one of the other things that I'm a fan of, I know it, it's sometimes hard to do given your work, is if you can leverage people who um, are uh, not just members of your representatives and your association, but people who are also practicing in the classroom or an education support professional to be part of that work group when that's being designed. Because I think sometimes what happens is all of us represent different groups, but there's nothing like this person who's doing that as their day job also designing at the same time. Now, you gotta free up their time. You gotta free up their time, you gotta give them a substitute, you gotta, and frankly, you should find a way to stipend for their time, I'm a huge fan of that. Um, you should be able to do that. And so, whatever I can do to be able to uh, subsidize that or provide that time or require it, I plan to do that, um, and so that's the only way the best ideas are gonna happen, and um, I'm sorry, central office by itself, we tend to become top down and we forget what it's like. So one, don't stop <laughs> bothering them about this, but two, um, find ways to leverage people who they, while they're in the job, they can also shape policy. Usually what happens is it's the people who are no longer in the job representing them, and no diss to those people, but I, you really need someone when they're in the job shaping policy. Yeah, so, yeah. We couldn't agree more. <laughs> There's too many people who even haven't walked in our shoes making um, those decisions. So you, you've talked about the importance of not only our teachers, but our education support professionals in all categories, administrators. We, re we represent administrators in the state of Maryland as well. Um, but we are, we are you, you put out something when we talked about snow days or inclement weather mm -hmm. days. And I want to make sure folks here know this. Yep. When we talk, the superintendent does listen. And when we were talking about virtual days being snow days, I said, there's a problem, though, our ESP may lose money if we do that. And so in the criteria for school systems to fill out, he said, you have to assure that nobody loses money on those days. And, and, and that's critically important to have it come from the state superintendent as our school systems are looking around that we know that our uh, education support professionals are important. All job classifications mm -hmm. are faced with shortages right now. Mm -hmm. And some of them are very deep, like in our special education, our counselors, mm -hmm. uh, critical roles. What are some initiatives that you are focused on to attract and retain educators mm -hmm. in different mm -hmm. job categories? It's a big question. I think, first of all, 
you know, the shortage conversation is also a wage conversation. Uh, people say, oh, well, it's not just about wages. Yes, you're right. It's about workload and everything else. But it's also about wages. You know, one of the things we should, you know, I know we're taking starting pay up to 60000 I know Maryland is minimum wage is going to $15. But I'm going to tell you something about $15 in Maryland. It doesn't get you very far when it comes to housing costs. Um, I'm a... I'm a huge, I'm a huge housing policy as education policy person. If I wasn't in education, I'd be in housing. The number of people, especially education support professionals, who make hourly wages, you know, $15, $18 is not even close to get you a two-bedroom apartment in Maryland. And we should find ways to lead the country in this, right? The, uh, I have a friend who works for the National Low Income Housing Coalition. You would have to make something like 30 hours, uh, sorry, $30 an hour, or work with tw uh, in the current minimum wage, 93 hours. That's not even humanly possible to not be rent burdened, which is more than 30% of your check. And so if Annapolis is serious about this with our historic surplus, raise it up to the level that it should be at. And so, um, and I will say, and this also means for our teachers as well, because they're the missing middle of income as well. 60,000 is not enough even to experience the American dream of housing affordability. And so that is the one thing I have not seen any state, red or blue, even blue, I'm originally from California, they suck in housing. <laughs> like they, you know, and, and, and they have a super majority and they can't even figure it out. Um, so uh, the reason why I'm ranting about this is because if you want to attract people, you should find ways to index wage with housing affordability. I think it would make a huge difference. So what's one thing that I plan to do is, I plan to be really loud about that. Why would the state superintendent want to talk about wages? Because people who are less stressed, worrying about paycheck to paycheck, right, are more likely to have kids who are less stressed and ready to learn at school and less disruptive. So let's do that. Um, so those are some things. Um, of course, you know, that all of that is not within my control, but, but I can be loud about it. Um, but there are things that are within my control, right? Um, uh, regulations for how you navigate and become a teacher, the certification rules, right? I think we do need to become, um, open up more holistic ways how we ensure teachers are ready. One standardized test doesn't tell you whether they're ready or not yet. I can tell you that. I can tell you, no one goes up to a teacher and says, what was your praxis score? No one says that. Like, no one says that at all. And so I'm willing to blow that up and find another way to do it. So I'll just say that. So, so, yeah. um, can I stop there? You want me to keep going? Oh, well, I just want you to share a little bit about some of your leads grants. Yes, so you to grow your yes, own and yes, have yes. So one of the things we did that I was really excited about is we had our federal set aside money. It's just one time money. We, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, so we push down all the federal money to, to the, through the locals and then we get a small percentage at the state level and I could do, I could, I could invest it back in the department or push it back down. I decided to put it back, push it back down, uh, but uh, we designed it around something called Maryland Leads and Maryland Leads had seven strategies. One of them was grow your own. So we really need to find a way to subsidize people's education for their commitment to become a teacher, whether it's a TA who wants to get, whether it's an early educator who wants to get a CDA, or it's a TA who wants to get a BA and eventually become an educator, or high school students, this especially matters for our people of color, like, right, that especially matters, because when you're becoming a teacher, it's not like you have, to, you still have to worry about your, uh, uh, your, 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 your expenses. And so being able to subsidize education is a big deal. So one of the things that we did in Grow Your Own is, hey, school system, if you design your own Grow Your Own system, we'll give you dollars to be able to take cohorts and subsidize their education in return for coming back and teaching and committing. We also did something called staff support and retention. So if some of you, um, I, I didn't mandate the way it can happen, but you could take dollars and give people 
a retention bonus, and some of you may have experienced that this year in, at varying levels. Some systems said we're going to give a retention bonus to everyone. Some said only sub, certain subgroups, um, especially uh, uh, our, my Eastern Shore districts who don't have counties that are not as progressive. Not everyone's Howard County, and so, uh, and so um, they leverage that to be able to give $500, $1,000 bonus. Those are appreciation bonuses. They're not long-term fixes. I already told you what the long-term fix is, raise that wage. But for now, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's worthwhile to give something for now, and, and, it, and it helped retain staff. So I was excited to do that as well. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So my last area, uh, well, since we're on wages and everything, I do want to give you, uh, we'll put it here, is we have approved, and we're going to roll out, our ESP Bill of Rights. So I want you to have the first actual copy okay. of that here which talks about a living wage and the respect and other things that you spoke about. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to uh, go off the questions, but I know you'll, you'll mm -hmm. be good, great with it. Um, science of Reading was part of our new business items today. Okay. And you put Science of Reading into In the Maryland. Leeds Grants. Yes, do you want to share what you yes. did with that? So, you know, it's, you know, we have um, learned so much about reading science, and Ed Prep uh, didn't do the greatest of jobs in ensuring that was true across um, all training programs. And so, you know, for our veterans, for our new teachers, right, we're going to make sure that they are getting science of reading and preparation and training on the front end. For our existing teachers, though, um, in order to do this well is, one, you got to make sure you compensate them for the time. So for Maryland Leeds, we ensured that in order for you to get science of reading dollars, and that was one of my special strategies where you can get bonus dollars, is you have to give stipends to your teachers. You have to give stipends to your teachers because it's like going back to school again. And so in order to do that well, you have to be able to give people stipended time in order to get retrained. And so what I want to do is find out any time you do trainings, you should, and, you, and, and you, we've learned much more about what, how reading should be taught, it's not just enough to say, hey, just go to PD and go spend a lot of time without being compensated for it. And so we are excited to be able to do that. I want to find a way to permanently do that in the state so no region, no region, no school system, whether it be Caroline or Garrett, um, right, or Kent, right, they should not be able to uh, say we don't have enough money to be able to pay our teachers, and everyone should be paid the same. I'm not feeling this whole let's let's uh, let's uh, um, adjust it based on how much it costs to live in Kent. No, let's f try to find what it actually costs to do this and give them that amount of money. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I want to thank you for joining us, and uh, the time goes so fast. That okay. was it. <laughs> okay. Is there any last comments you want to share? I'm sure the survey you want them to fill out. Yes. Or? No, I think, you know, I'm, what I love about Maryland is um, it's smaller than Texas, <laughs> smaller than California. So everyone's engaged. Everyone's engaged. And, and what I also love about that is, and yes, I'm going to say this as state super, you don't get to get away without not engaging. And I, I love that people are very, very, very focused on education. Um, but people also need to have a conversation about there's all these great things Blueprint's going to do to invest in the classroom. But if you don't take care of your staff, students are not going to learn at scale. And so that's very important. And I think the Blueprint did some of that. It is putting more dollars into the system. It is saying teacher pay should go up here. Teacher scale should go here. But it should do that for the entire ecosystem of what's happening. So this is your cafeteria workers, your TAs, et cetera. And I think if we really want to do it, one way to look at it is through housing costs, really. Like, think about the number. How many of you pay more than a third of your paycheck to housing costs? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's a lot of people. And, and so do teachers. And so if you take care of that, Right, Maryland can do this, and we are one of the most affluent states in the country with progressive mindsets. The same Texas, we should figure this out. <laughs> so. And I thank God every day I'm not Texas. Yes. So, delegates, give it up for our superintendent, Mohammed Chaudhary. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank thank you. you so much. Thanks. I hope that was helpful. Yeah. <laughs>